it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, to uh, host and, and uh, invite George uh, to uh, give uh, uh, the seminar and perspective on uh, Jay Caesar. Um, uh, George holds um, a senior scientist position at the uh, Argonne National Lab. He's a distinguished fellow there. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, and uh, many other things. Um, uh, one thing that George probably also doesn't know here uh, is when I was uh, when I was uh, applying for faculty positions, uh, I read uh, this BSAC report uh, from Quanta to Continuum, uh, page to page, to try and shape my uh, research vision. Uh, George was one of the co-chairs uh, putting that uh, document together. It's a wonderful 80-page document. Uh, it's now four years old. There's a newer version uh, of that report. Uh, and I think it really shapes the challenges uh, that we face, uh, the world faces uh, in energy sciences, uh, and really gives uh, sort of very concrete uh, research challenges uh, uh, that one can work on. Um, another thing that I want to point out um, is um, George is also the director of J. Caesar, uh, which is possibly the largest uh, research effort on batteries in the entire world. Um, and if you want to know uh, behind the scenes what happened, uh, there was a wonderful book uh, written by Steve Levine. Uh, many of you uh, uh, have met Steve uh, when uh, he came last year as part of uh, the Scott Seminar Series, uh, and also some of you that took my class. Um, so the book is called Powerhouse. Um, there are two parallel stories. Uh, one is a success story, uh, and the other one, not so much. One is about uh, Argon. One is set in Argonne, uh, and uh, chronicles um, uh, the behind-the-scenes um, proposal writing uh, and uh, all the sort of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, that scientists face uh, in putting a team like this together, um, and th and they finally won the J. Caesar um, uh, Center Award, uh, and uh, it uh, really makes it, it's it's a gripping read. Uh, you know, it's it's almost impossible to imagine that uh, a book about the life of scientists could be made this interesting. Uh, it's a spectacular book. I would highly highly encourage everyone to read it, uh, and. Um, I think since then, uh, Jay Caesar has grown uh, enormously and has had enormous scientific impact. And I invite George to tell us about it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Venkat. <laughs> what a pleasure to be here. Uh, what a tough act to follow. I heard you had somebody important here yesterday. Uh, and of course, <laughs> And of course, Pat uh, Falcone was just before me, and we know each other, we're chatting in between the two talks. But what a pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed, I was here, came last night, I've been here this morning. Lots of good conversations with Venkat and others. Uh, and uh, I'm going away inspired. So I would like, I'm glad to hear, Venkat, that you read that mesoscale report. That's wonderful news. I'm glad it's having an impact. Uh, it was a pleasure to write, and uh, I agree with you. It does, it does lay out some challenges for the future. So I want to talk about energy storage and uh, next generation. I have four things that I want to cover. So a little bit about lithium ion. That's the dominant battery now. And we can learn a lot from where it came from and how it behaves. Then I want to talk about transportation futures, and maybe this is the right place to talk about self-driving cars, since you guys are now experiencing it in Pittsburgh, uh, and some other things that may happen, and electricity grid futures, and especially beyond lithium-ion batteries. So Jay Caesar, uh, their, our goal is to make the next generation beyond lithium-ion battery that will be five times better and five times cheaper. Very aggressive goals. That's kind of what you need to be transformative, and that was our, that was our goal. So that's what I want to do. Let's start, uh, yeah, before we start, if you want to know more, here's a review article that was published last December in MRS Bulletin that talks about a lot of the themes that I'm going to present. So it's not exactly a written version of this talk, but there's a lot in there that may be useful. And the URL is there. Our web page is on the right. It's, uh, it was revised last spring, so it's uh, got a lot of new material. It's always updated. 
It's very clickable. So I like to read the news on the New York Times on the web and I just click from one thing to the next. Oh, what about that? What about that? Well, you can do that with our web page too. So if you're looking for more information, I would say check out at least these two things. Um, so let's talk about transformations for a minute. So the lithium ion battery came out in 1991. Sony brought it out. Uh, it changed ultimately personal electronics. It made it possible. Uh, and everything you see in that picture is powered by a lithium ion battery. Uh, and especially in the mid 2000s, smartphones came out and that changed dramatically the way society works. So if I want to talk to somebody, let him be in China. I can call with my cell phone wherever I am and more, more than likely get a hold of him and have my conversation and I don't need a land phone, I don't need a phone booth. Uh, if I want to know something, a piece of information, I can, on, again, my smartphone, check the web, get the answer instantly. I could never have done that. Uh, go back, say, 15 years. So this dramatically changed the way society works, the way we interact with people and the way we interact with information. That's my example of a transformation. Uh, and you may ask, as I will in this talk, what are some more transformations that could occur? Well, one is obviously transportation, and I've put an aggressive goal there, a 20K electric car. So, of course, we already have uh, cars, and some of the cars go a long distance, like the Tesla. Uh, it's going to cost you, at the moment, 80K or more uh, to get a significant range. And that is not transformational. That's a high-end car for a very small part of the market. In order to be transformational, you've got to get the price down, you've got to get the, the range up. And I put this number 20K just as a provocative number. If there were a 20K, let's say 200 mile electric car, everyone would say, that's what I want. So that's, that's the goal we're shooting for. Um, and the other one, the other transformation that could happen is grid scale electricity storage. So that means the wide scale deployment of wind and solar, and I was telling Venkat at lunchtime, I uh, was reading the preprint of an economics article that was analyzing what would it cost to replace all the electricity generation system in the U.S. with wind and solar, renewable, get rid of all the fossil completely, and nuclear and everything else. Of course, an intellectual exercise, but it was very interesting. One of the conclusions of that paper was that the cost of the storage to smooth and back up the renewables in the worst case scenario, it could be five times the cost of, of the actual wind and solar generation itself. So storage plays a critical role there and getting the cost down is a critical factor. So these two things are waiting to happen. The first one has already happened. So you might be, I clicked a little too fast, so I was going to ask you, but you see the answer up there. Uh, you might be interested in how much energy each one of these transformative technologies uses. So personal electronics, although it's everywhere, pervasive, uses less than 2% of all the energy, not electricity, but all the energy in the United States. Transportation uses a lot more. We know exactly how much that is because that's the gas in your tank. Uh, and that's, uh, there's the number, 28% uh, of US energy. 10 times bigger. It's a much bigger market than personal electronics, and this is what's attracting everyone's attention, researchers and business people alike. Grid-scale electric storage is even, I'm, I'm sorry, the grid is even bigger, so that's 39%. Uh, so the two things that are waiting to happen, transportation and the grid, account for about two-thirds of all the energy use in the United States. Factor of 10 or more, bigger than personal electronics. This is the next generation of battery. That's the market that's waiting for the successful developer of the next generation battery. So here's a little bit about lithium ion experience. If you want to predict the future or try to predict the future, it's best to look at the past. Uh, the lithium ion battery was first conceived in the late or middle 70s. Uh, and the idea was let's use intercalation to store energy. So intercalation had been used as a synthesis technique 
for example, graphite intercalates all kinds of things, and you heard a lot about graphite intercalation compounds, how to create 50 or 100 new compounds by intercalation. In the 70s, people realized uh, that indeed uh, there's sometimes a lot of energy involved in the intercalation process, and you can actually store energy that way. So that was the idea of the lithium ion battery. It was in a 20 year incubation period until 1991, where a lot of things happened in this 20 years. A lot of good ideas failed, and that's one of the points I'll make in a minute. But in 1991, Sony brought it out because they wanted to power a, a camcorder that they wanted to be more, more uh, portable. Uh, and in 1991, these were the two best batteries around, be, uh, exclusive of lithium ion, nickel metal hydride and, and uh, nickel cadmium. And they had about half the energy density of lithium ion when it came out. So that's the red spot here. And that was enough to get this camcorder over the top and actually to eventually create the personal electronics transformation that we were talking about, although no one knew it at the time. So the red line is the energy density of lithium ion batteries, and that's over here on the right-hand scale. It's gone up remarkably linearly for reasons that I don't understand and maybe nobody does and maybe it's not even important, but by a factor of three since 1991. So that factor of three and the factor of two uh, that it was better than the next best battery, factor of six, that's what made personal electronics. Can you imagine your cell phone or your laptop if it were six times bigger and six times heavier? So you probably wouldn't use it the way you use it now. So in this case, it was performance that made the difference. The blue line and the left-hand scale is the cost. So the cost of lithium ion has come, to come down by more than a factor of 10 since 1991. And the remarkable thing about the cost is although it's leveling off here, it's still falling faster than anyone has projected. So go back five years and ask what's the projection for the cost of a lithium ion battery in 2016. It's significantly higher than the actual cost today. So this cost curve is falling and that's having a huge impact. Uh, you uh, might uh, ask how far can it go well, there is a limit. Uh, the cost of the materials would be one floor. That's actually quite a bit below this. But the fact that the cost is falling is due to a couple of things, or maybe three things. Better materials. So we're putting now, for example, silicon into the graphite anode. That should get the cost down and the energy up. Uh, we learned how to make the battery cheaper, so we can just learning curve. Uh, and competition. So a lot of battery makers are competing with each other for market share because they see this 10 times greater market coming down the road and they want to position themselves for it. So you probably can buy a lithium ion battery for a little bit less than you should be able to simply because of competition. So what are some of the lessons? Well, long incubation period. So one of the things that Jay Caesar wants to do is shorten that in incubation period. I'll tell you how we're going to do that later on. Um, the battery that came out in 91 didn't look anything like what was imagined in the 70s. And this is an important point. So you wanted to, in the 70s, they wanted to have a lithium metal anode. We're not able to do that. In spite of a lot of trying before 1991 to make that work, they couldn't. Finally made a strategic decision, let's go with carbon and ultimately graphite. Uh, factor of 10 less energy density in graphite than you would have had in lithium metal itself as an anode. So they, everyone, the whole community, was quite reluctant to give up this vision. Nevertheless, give it up they did, and it's a good thing because look what came out and look at all the high impact that it had. So uh, things, and there are lots of other things in this 20 year incubation period that didn't work. So the lesson, Many, and that's being generous, maybe one should say most, good ideas fail in the battery business. They don't fail because the idea was bad. They fail usually because something you didn't think about disables it. So side reactions. There's a lot of chemistry that goes on in a battery because there's a lot of materials in there and very often there's a side reaction that you didn't consider that uses up the active material or in some other way disables the battery operation. So it's good to the, the, uh, the sort of the lesson from that is you have to have multiple paths forward. 
you can't put all your eggs in one basket and expect it to succeed. It probably won't. So, and this is one thing we do in JCSER. We analyze the challenges and we have two or three, sometimes four, approaches to solve that challenge because we know that some of them will fail. We expect that. So there's um, some lessons. Let's talk a little bit about personal transportation challenges. Uh, you can all buy a Tesla car, an expensive one, which is the one you can buy now. The Model S may come out later, uh, year or two. Uh, but let's talk for the moment about what you can buy now. What do you want? You want a driving range that is hundreds of miles uh, instead of tens of miles, which is pretty much what LEAF was and other electric cars. So that's pretty clear. You want fast charging, so minutes, like you fill up your gas tank on your gasoline car uh, in minutes, not hours. It's going to take you eight hours to charge at home or maybe an hour or an hour and a half if you go to a special Tesla charging station. You want it to be inexpensive. We've talked about that 20K to pick up most of the market instead of 80K. Cycle life, many people don't think about this, but lithium ion batteries are guaranteed for eight years by law. Uh, but the life of a car is 15 or 16 years. So you might have to replace that battery over the lifetime of the car, and that can be an expensive proposition, maybe depending on the car, $8,000 or $20,000. And that's something that many people don't think about at the moment of buying the car. And safety is really important, as we know from the Samsung uh, issues that are in the news now. Uh, if it's not safe and perceived as being safe by the public, it's a non-starter. So that's important. So that's what you want. And now there is, some of these problems can be addressed by simply the lower price of the standard lithium ion battery, as we saw in the last view graph. Uh, and uh, so let's see about which challenges the lower cost can address. And I have in mind the Tesla Model 3 and the GM Bolt. 35K, 200 miles. Sounds very, very appealing, and indeed it is. Driving range, yeah, 200 miles is pretty good. That would satisfy many, many uh, drivers. Fast charging, unchanged. Same battery, just more of it, so it's going to take you the same time to charge. Inexpensive, 35K is great. In fact, 35K is about the median price of a new car in the States, so you might think that gives you access to half the market and, and you know that's quite impressive but that's not 20k and if you look at the projections for how many electric cars of any kind including these will be sold it's a few percent very much like the Prius so it's in the five percent range that's not transformative so to be transformative you need 50 percent not five percent so uh, cycle life same battery unchanged Safety, same battery, unchanged. So you can address some of the issues by lowering the cost of lithium ion, but not all of them. And the bottom line lesson here is that for transportation, lithium ion batteries may be competitive, but probably not transformative. You, that is, you may need the next generation of battery. So this is sort of the way we operate cars now, the personal car ownership model. There are other models, and let's take a look at that. So this is personal vehicles. What do you get with the today's model? Well, usually single occupancy. Most cars have only the driver, nobody else. The car is generally parked about 95% of the time. So you park it all night. You may park it all day where you work. And you do a little bit of driving 5% of the time, but not much. Uh, and uh, that means there's a lot of cars on the road at rush hour. So the congestion can be really, really high. That wastes everyone's time and is actually a, a rather uh, inefficient use of the cars that are out there. So here's the congestion. You may recognize that, but it's not in Pittsburgh. Uh, and there's plenty of accidents. And the accidents, of course, they cost you time and money and make your insurance premiums higher. So there are other models. What are they? Well, one of them, and you can see from this crosshairs, uh, I'm going to fill every one of those boxes. Ride sharing, uh, Uber and Lyft, people really, everybody I know that uses Uber and Lyft, they like the service enormously. It's very convenient. It puts very often more than one passenger in the car. Of course, you have the driver, but very often I'm with a group, we're all going the same place. Let's get an Uber. 
so you can uh, up the occupancy. Uh, and that means that you're going to have a car maybe used 75% of the time, depending on how much the driver sleeps or how many drivers there are, 25% parked, and much more mileage. So the average mileage of a personal car might be 12 to 15,000 miles a year. Average mileage of a taxi is 70,000 miles. So it's a high mileage car, and there may be fewer on the road. The other thing is um, self-driving cars, so autonomous cars. Um, and uh, this is Tesla, right? So uh, if, the, if the cars talk to each other, they're really connected, then indeed you can make the, you can reduce con congestion. The traffic can flow very uh, much more effectively. I don't think I did that, did I? No, I know, it's just okay. And, oh, there it goes. Uh, and, uh, and there could be fewer accidents. So this is the model of personally owned autonomous vehicles. But then there's, in a sense, the, the ultimate, and that's shared connected autonomous vehicles in the upper right. So cars would change. Just above that image, you see a four-person car with no driver. So you could have, that could be an autonomous Uber car, for example. Uh, and uh, to the right is the Google car designed for just one or maybe two people. You call it on your cell phone, it comes pick you up, comes to pick you up. And the advantages are up there in the, in the upper corner. Fewer accidents, less congestion, lower cost, higher occupancy, and fewer cars. So it's a very different model for transportation. And it's enabled by really three things. The three things are here, ride sharing, electric vehicles and autonomous connected vehicles, and that leads us to the, to the bottom line. So why ride sharing? Fewer, higher mileage vehicles. Why electric? Because the maintenance and fuel costs are less. Think about the moving parts in, an elect in a gasoline engine, lots of them, pistons, valves, all kinds of things. In an electric drive car, it's basically one moving part. It's the shaft of the motor that, that rotates, and that's it. So the maintenance cost is less. Is less. Uh, the fuel cost is less. So with today's gasoline prices, you're paying somewhere around eight cents or 12 cents a mile. The cost of electricity is a factor of two lower. So it doesn't cost you as much to power the car. And these two things mean that if you're running a high mileage car, as you would in some of these uh, transportation models for the future, you have to have an electric car. Uh, and of course, connectedness and autonomous smart traffic flow. So these are the things that go into it. Uh, if you look at some of the numbers for cost, I found this interesting. It's a report by the Rocky Mountain Institute. Various cars, gasoline hybrids, some EVs, uh, and the, the four on the left in green show that the BYD, a Chinese car actually in this analysis, came out to be the lowest. And the two cars that are going to come out, the Tesla Model S and the Bolt, are even lower. And they're cutting the cost down, not quite by a factor of two in this analysis. So you can see the importance of the, uh, of the electric car. And uh, similar, uh, different, but Rocky Mountain Institute report suggested that this may drive down personal ownership. So in this report, they're suggesting that in 2020, will be the, that will be the peak year for car ownership, and after that, personal car ownership will decline and mobility service car ownership will grow. So it's coming maybe faster than we thought. You guys know this better than anyone because last month Uber deployed self-driving cars in Pittsburgh. The US Department of Transportation issued guidelines for autonomous cars to kind of try out the system, see what, what you need for regulation. And of course, President Obama wrote a beautiful op-ed which was in the local paper here. So that's transportation. Let's talk a little bit about the electricity grid. Uh, first of all, storage, uh, when you talk about, first of all, let's go back to transportation for a minute. You basically want to get from A to B. And you're asking the question, how many different ways can I get from A to B? Same functionality. With the grid, it's different. You're going to have a different functionality. It's not the same service that you're trying to provide. It's a different service. Uh, and indeed, the most fundamental thing about storage for the grid 
is it breaks the historic constraint that you have to generate energy at exactly the same rate that you use it. And this is a huge restriction. We're so used to it, as the grid's done this for over 100 years, ever since it was born, that we think it's quite natural, but it isn't. And in order to understand how unnatural it is, imagine if that constraint were applied to your personal finances. So you had to spend every dollar you made the moment you made it. Doesn't make much sense. You could never save for a vacation. You couldn't save for a house. You couldn't save for retirement. Uh, you couldn't save for a college education for your children. You would be working and not getting the benefit of that work if you had to spend all your money at one time. And you might decide, as the grid has decided, I'll only work when I want to buy something. That's basically what the grid does. Very, very ineffective. So when you break that constraint, there are a lot of things that change about the grid. You, for renewables, you might want to firm the fluctuations because second to second or minute to minute, you might want to time shift. And in fact, in California, there's so much solar on the roof that in the afternoon, they don't need the solar, but they do need it at sunset. Almost by definition, that's the peak demand. People are turning on lights and cooking dinner and so on. Uh, and uh, you, so you may want to time shift about four hours. You can do that with storage. Uh, you might want to combine energy storage with two other actually dramatically different and emerging opportunities. Smart, so we, do, we talk about the smart grid all the time. It's actually not that smart at the moment. We, need, we could make it a lot smarter than it is. Uh, and distributed energy resources, for example, solar on the roof. Uh, and when you combine these three things, you get all kinds of new paradigms that, that might come into play. So the bottom line, the grid challenges and opportunities are, for storage are much richer, much more expansive, and much less explored than they are for transportation. So there's, a, I think, a bigger opportunity here. And that's kind of illustrated by this tiny little diagram. Today, the, most of the grid is really not very smart. We don't have any storage, and there's not a lot of distributed resources. On these three axes, you can imagine a lot of new paradigms and com by combining them in various ways. And the grid of the future will not look like the grid of the past. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, this is a graph that I have used, we have all used in J. Caesar since our proposal. It was in our proposal. What do we want to do? We have a very simple vision. It's up there. Uh, transform transportation and the electricity grid with high performance, low cost energy storage. Big vision, it's going to take decades for that to happen, but we have a much more well-defined and near-term mission, and that is deliver electrical energy storage with five times the energy density, one-fifth the cost, do it within five years. Now, we're, I'll tell you, we're a little bit more than three and a half years into the first five. So we have a little bit less than a year and a half to go. And I will show you uh, that we're on track to, I think we're on track to do that. How do we want to do it? Well, we've said all along we want to accomplish three things and we call them the legacies. First one is a fundamental understanding of uh, energy storage science, battery operation, materials and phenomena at the atomic and molecular level. Uh, and this is not always normal in the battery R&D community. So probably one of the weakest things about lithium ion batteries is the cathode. And your typical approach would be, uh, I need a better cathode, let me try this. If it works, I'll use it. Doesn't work, I'll throw it away, I'll try something else. But I won't ask the question, why did it work or why did it fail? And that's the question that Jay Caesar wants to answer at the atomic and molecular level. Because we feel that if we understand why things work and how things work at that basic level, we can identify the next material we want much more quickly than if we don't understand it. And once we identify it, we can get the highest performance and lowest cost out of that material because, again, we understand. So that's the first one. Second one, two prototypes, one for the car, one for the grid. Going to look very different, of course, because you know, they're just different. Uh, but they might be based on the same set of fundamental science that we get out of the first legacy. So we kill two birds with one stone with this first legacy. And the third thing, which may turn out to be the most important, 
a new paradigm for doing battery R&D that, that integrates. So it combines four things in one organization. And what are the four? Discovery science, battery design, research prototyping, and manufacturing collaboration. And usually these four things are done by four completely separate organizations that may be different geographical locations, different continents. University maybe does the discovery. Somebody else has to decide to make a battery out of it and so on. So you can go a lot faster and it's in fact here that we hope to reduce that 20 year incubation period that we saw for lithium ion. So here's a picture, a diagram, our, kind of our functional diagram of what we do. The four things at the bottom, you see three labels there in red and I'll tell a little bit more about those. Those are the sort of the conceptual ideas that we're following. Uh, we bring, well let me before I do that, this is important, single highly interactive organization so we can go fast and we only work on beyond lithium ion. There's plenty of motivations and organizations out there that are pursuing lithium ion, the next generation of lithium ion. We only look beyond that so we've narrowed our focus. We bring some things to the table that are special. We simulate materials on the computer before we make them in the lab. So you may need a crystalline cathode, let's say for a magnesium battery. Well, instead of just trying them all, let's do 2,000 simulations on the computer and analyze which four or five are the most promising and let's make those in the lab. We do the same for liquid organic electrolytes and this is something that was sort of around before J. Caesar but we certainly took it to the next level. We now have, I think it's 26,000 organic molecules in our database that we can then use as the building blocks to make, design, and make uh, new electrolytes for batteries. So this was not common before J. Caesar. We have a thing called the Electrochemical Discovery Lab which looks at interfaces. So the crystalline interface and the liquid electrolyte, all the electrochemistry happens at that interface. So we send in all kinds of probes, x-rays, uh, infrared, we have scanning electrochemistry probes, we do standard voltometry for electrochemistry and, and other things, all state of the art to look at that interface and that lets us really understand what's going on in a controlled way. We do what's called techno-economic modeling, so just like we simulate materials on the computer before we make them in the lab, we simulate the battery system before we assemble the battery system as a prototype. So this looks at how does the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte, how do they work together? And we want to project two things. How would it perform? That's the first five that we're going after. Uh, and what would it cost to make it? That's the second five. So informed by these, by now 20 or so techno-economic models of various battery systems, we can choose the ones that look the most promising before we start to make them. And finally up there in the right says sprints, uh, something we stole basically from, uh, from semiconductor electronics. We look at every battery we want to make and we ask what are the four or five biggest challenges? to making that battery. You have to answer this question. And then for each one of those, we assign a team of maybe five to 15 people to look at that challenge. And we give them a time limit, typically six months. In six months, tell us the answer. You can do it or you can't do it. And you can get three answers back. You can say, no, you can't do it. Okay, well then maybe we'll drop that line. Uh, or yes, you can do it. Okay, then let's be looking at the other challenges, which we probably were doing simultaneously. Or we're not sure if you can do it or not. Maybe you can. We got some ideas, but we don't know if it works. We might send that problem back to the science, discovery science teams and materials teams and say, here's the problem you have to solve if you want this, this prototype to work. So what we've noticed, so these teams are only six months long. Uh, and what we've noticed is the ones that are led by early career scientists do a little better than the ones led by senior scientists. And you might ask why. Well, senior scientists have a lot on their plate. They can't devote full time to this sprint. Uh, but the early career scientist can. And he can do a lot more communication. He can do a lot more coordinating. He can call a lot more in-person meetings. 
uh, and uh, they, they tend to go faster. Another good thing about having early career folks lead these sprints, get some experience in leadership. How do you make things happen? How do you make people work together? Make is the wrong word, it's always encourage. How do you encourage people to work together? And if it fails, Sprint was a failure, well, it's only six months out of your life, it doesn't hang over you for the rest of your career, you go on to the next thing. So we found this to be really, really effective. Here's our team, so it's big. We have 20 institutions, so it's five national labs, 10 universities, and five private companies. Uh, and all together, they're all across the US, uh, 180 to 200 researchers, and you might ask, as we did, and everybody asked us at the beginning, how are you going to make a thing like that work? Uh, and I will tell you, the secret is in-person communication. So in our proposal, we said, yeah, we'll have a lot of conference calls and video conferences, just like being there. Turns out it isn't. So if I'm on a conference call and there's no video, I will tell you what I'm doing secretly. <laughs> I'm answering my email. Uh, and not fully engaging in the call. If you're in person, you can't really do that. So we resolved to meet every three months, 25 of us or so, uh, to examine strategy. Are we going in the right direction? Is this direction working or not working? Should we make a change? And every year or so, we in fact do make a change. We change our strategy. One of the things we did is we quit working on lithium air not because it's a bad, this is about a year and a half into Jay Caesar, not because it's a bad idea, but just because we felt it had challenges that were more than five years off. So it's a very good idea, but maybe let's reserve that, that for the future. And instead, we put those resources onto lithium sulfur, very similar technology, but more near term. So we do that, and it's really the in-person interactions and the trust that's built up that really counts. Uh, so, I said I would talk about those three concepts, so here we go. This is the lithium ion battery, and most of us, I think, in the room probably know how it works. The lithium sits in the cathode on the right, it's a metal oxide, when it's discharged. If you want to charge it up, you put a, a, a voltage across the battery and the lithium ions migrate to the anode, which is graphite. They sit in between the layers, they intercalate. Uh, when it's fully charged, you take the, uh, the voltage off and hook up the external circuit, might be your car, and the lithium goes the other way and that's how you just discharge. So this is sometimes called a rocking chair battery. So it rocks from one side to the other, the lithium's on the anode side, it's on the cathode side, it's charging, it's discharging, and the nice thing about it is you never have any free lithium, only lithium ions. So there's lithium in the cathode, there's lithium in the anode, but there's no free lithium. That actually helps the safety situation. What do we want to do to, how could you make that better? Well, the first way you could make it better is say, there's one charge on lithium, let's get rid of the lithium and put in something that has two charges, and magnesium is our favorite now, but people also talk about calcium and zinc as divalent working ions. You would get rid of the graphite uh, anode and have a pure magnesium metal anode that ups the energy density. The fact that it's a two charge ion that's going back and forth instead of a one charge ion doubles the amount of energy that goes back and forth on each cycle. So there are lots of ways here, lots of promise for uh, reaching these aggressive factors of five. The second idea is get rid of intercalation altogether. So on the right hand side, I put sulfur there because that's what we're working on. Put a real, you know, use a real chemical reaction. So use something with covalent chemical bonds. You can store a lot more energy in a covalent chemical bond than you can in an intercalation geometry. So this, in lithium air, you hear very often, oh, 10 times the energy density of, of lithium ion. True and lithium sulfur is uh, five times. Five times the theoretical, it's actually 10 times the actual lithium ion that, that we have now. So um, that's the advantage of it. You, there's really a lot of headroom. Of course you would use a lithium metal anode and that's a challenge. We never were able to make that work for the lithium ion battery. But there are lots of ideas and the whole community is working on this, including Jay Caesar. Lots of ideas that, that may actually work. The third and last idea is get rid of the crystalline electrodes altogether. Replace them with a liquid. So the liquid would be either a solution, 
or a suspension of nanoparticles. And the big advantage of this so-called flow battery uh, is that it's scalable. So if I make that tank of active uh, uh, ions 10 times larger, I can store 10 times the energy density. You can't do that with a lithium ion battery. If you try to make the cathode or the anode bigger than a certain amount, the working ion has to travel through the cathode or the anode and it never makes it to the other side. So there's a limit to how much you can scale it. Here, there's fundamentally no limit. So for the grid where you need lots of energy, this would be a very attractive choice. We were further thinking why, and there are vanadium flow batteries out there now, transition metal, and you can change vanadium oxidation state by two, that's pretty good. But if you think about organics as the active material, replace vanadium with an organic, you can change the oxidation state by two or three or four in some organics, so that's good. The organics are cheap. Uh, they're recyclable, at least in principle, if you recycle back to the element, harmless to the environment. Uh, but the major thing is that you can tailor the organic. So imagine a carbon ring, six carbons. You can hang a different pendant molecule off of each one of those carbon atoms. And that means you can tailor the solubility, that's energy density. You can tailor the activity, that's the voltage range over which the battery operates. You can tailor the stability, how long will it last, simply by changing those pendant molecules. So there's a lot of flexibility here that you can access that you cannot access with a traditional vanadium flow battery. We took it one step further, and this is a, a, a J. Caesar original. We said, why use one molecule, one organic molecule, as the active material? Why not hook them together? So hook maybe three to 10 of these organic active molecules together and make an oligomer. Or hook them all onto a polymer backbone, a thousand of them, and make it a polymer. Why not cross-link that polymer and make it a colloidal particle where you might have a million or a billion active molecules all in one unit. And that gives you another degree of freedom, so to speak, another design parameter. And one of the very nice design parameters is that if the molecule is big enough, you can use a porous membrane to separate the anode tank, which is sometimes called the analyte tank, from the catholite tank and prevent crossover of the analyte to the catholite chambers. Because if you have crossover, you're basically shorting the battery out. So you always have to prevent this. And if the molecule is big enough, you can do it with a very cheap porous filter. So those are the ideas. Uh, and now we have, so here, this is an important statement. We have chosen four directions in January of this year to focus on four specific batteries from among these three types that we talked about. Our favorite for transportation is the lithium sulfur stationary battery. The one that we think may be a little bit farther off because the problems are bigger is a multivalent, actually divalent battery and magnesium is our favorite choice. Uh, for the grid, our favorite is this organic redox flow that I was talking about. Uh, in the macro molecular that is oligomer or polymer or colloidal form. And a very clever air-breathing aqueous sulfur battery, which we just started about a year ago. The idea of this battery is it's cheap. So it uses sulfur, actually as the anode in this case, not the cathode. But sulfur is extremely cheap and extremely abundant. And it uses water as the electrolyte. Nothing is cheaper than water. So the, the fact that this is so cheap means that it might be able to compete with pumped hydro for the cost of storage. And indeed, it might be so cheap that it could enable seasonal energy storage. So you store solar energy in the summer and you use it in the winter, for example. So these are the four directions. Uh, and as I mentioned, and I actually have some supplemental slides that I won't show, but happy to share with people about each one of these directions and where we are and where the challenges are. But I think, oh yes, very importantly, we have now uh, spun out two startups. One is Blue Current, 
uh, which uh, was, depends on JCs or IP. It looks at solid state electrolytes. Second one is Sepion, which looks at a special polymer, a porous polymer filter, which would be the separator in a, in a flow battery between the analyte and the catholyte that would prevent crossover. New idea, depending on how you make the polymer membrane, you can adjust the pore size from, let's call it, three quarters of a nanometer to one and a half nanometers. And that turns out that's just the right size to block transmission of a three molecule oligomer. So our target now for the organic redox flow is using that porous polymer membrane that was invented in Jay Caesar and uh, a three molecule oligomer as the active material and that looks really, really promising. So um, I'm done. Here, if you wanna know more, the first three things are about transportation, which I think are, are really exciting opportunities. You know, what about self-driving cars and so on? And the stuff at the bottom is more about batteries uh, themselves, so next generation batteries. And I would especially recommend that thing that says good stuff. Uh, two guys from uh, public broadcasting came out to Argonne and spent a day with film unit and everything. And they, the theme of their short piece is that um, if you brought back the ghost of Alexander Graham Bell and showed him a cell phone, he would say, what's that? He'd be baffled. He would say, that can't be a cell phone. You're not even talking into it. You're punching buttons on it. That's not a phone. He wouldn't recognize it. If you brought back the ghost of Thomas Edison and showed him the grid, he'd say, oh, I, I recognize that grid. It's almost the same as the one I made. And that just sort of dramatizes the transformation that's wait, that has already happened with, with phones and has not yet happened with the grid. So with that, I'm gonna stop. Thank you. Thank you.